Good morning. Good Lainey. morning. So it is great that you, you know, grant us this interview. It is mainly for my students in a course called Turning Points in the History of Mathematics. And there is at least one chapter on algorithms and computing. So I am very, very happy that I can talk with you this morning. When I saw the book announced, it was in the New York Review of Books, June 23, and there was a line beneath saying, a timely release that will satisfy the mathematically curious. So I got the book. Would you like to comment on this statement? Well, first of all, I'm very glad that it prompted you to get the book, which was surely the um, aim of the announcement, but I was somewhat amused that that strand of the book was singled out. As you say, um, there are really two chapters that I think are mostly mathematical in content, the chapter on algorithms and the chapter on calculating intelligence and the mechanization of calculation. But the rest of the book is a kind of miscellany of every kind of rule you can think of, from wars, war rules, rules of the battlefield, to um, rules of games, to cookbooks, to rules about who can wear what when, to um, laws, including the natural laws of science. So it is true that there is a strong mathematical component to the book, but it is not only about mathematics. Mm -hmm. So when did you start imagining such a book? I saw a Vimeo of you years ago, 2010. You know, you were at the Wissenschaft colleague and you were talking already a lot about rules. So is that the time when all started? When did you start imagining this book? I, I think the book, I think you're absolutely right to pinpoint it at that moment. I had the very good fortune to be part of a working group at the institute where I work, the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin, um, with five other people. And we were working on a book about Cold War rationality. Um, and the book eventually came out in 2014 with the title, How Reason Almost Lost Its Mind. And the core argument of this book was that the um, peculiar, really unprecedented situation faced by the Cold War superpowers, by the Soviet Union and the United States, was one in which um, deliberation, the usual kind of decision-making, was a luxury that could not be afforded because a ballistic missile could reach Washington from Moscow and vice versa um, in a matter of 30 minutes. So there would be no time for the usual forms of strategic thinking, deliberation, negotiation. Mm -hmm. And in that situation, what you would need would be absolutely strict, irrefragable, transparent rules so that the other side knew exactly what would happen should it launch um, a nuclear attack. And that was the um, notorious mad strategy, mutual assured destruction. What that meant was that forms of judgment, deliberation, negotiation, all of the apparatus of state decision making were suspended in favor of a very specific kind of rule, the algorithm. And that was the departure point for the book. Thank you. So it became a book for the general public. You know, as you say, a miscellanea on how to cook, <laughs> how to do division, how to, uh, you know, the Benedict, you talk a lot about the Benedictines mm -hmm. and the rules. So it is a book for the general public. Uh, maybe this surprised you, surprised the author. But I think it really became... surprised the publishers. <laughs> 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 Fine. Rules, canons, paradigms, models, procedures. In your introduction, you go through the similarities and differences among these concepts. Would you, you know, briefly illustrate the perspective of the book on them, on this plethora of concepts that are all related somehow? So as I said, if one were to just survey the rules in one culture, um, you would be overwhelmed by the dazzling variety of these rules. And of course, there are sheer numbers, not to mention other cultures and other epochs. So I needed 
in this labyrinth, um, a scarlet thread of Ariadne to guide me through. And I started with the meanings of the word um, canon in ancient Greek and the word regula in Latin, um, and noticed that there were three meanings, three major meanings, two of which persist to this day. Um, one of which is, as you've already mentioned, um, the algorithm, a mathematical meaning, but a meaning that then expanded to include any set of um, very determinate um, and inflexible instructions, and the law. Those are two aspects of rules that we immediately recognize. But there was a third aspect, which in many ways, until about 1800, was the predominant one, which is the rule as a model. And that's where the rules of the Benedictine monasteries come in, because mm -hmm. um, they are about following a model of behavior in addition to detailed precepts of how every aspect of life in the monastery should be conducted. So the arc of the book, in some ways, is the decline of the meaning of the rule as model, and the rise and rise and rise of the meaning of the rule as algorithm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So algorithm, of course, for us is fundamental. And as you write in the book, the, con the word algorithm comes from the name of a Persian mathematician, Persian from Horezm al-Harizmi, and it became algorithmi in, you know, algorithm Dixit or so. And so that's one thing of al Kharezmi. And also we know, we have to know that al Kharezmi is the one who writes a book with the title from which the word algebra comes from. Al-Jabra, you know, compensation and so on. So al Kharezmi is very important for, should be even more important for us. Um, but, of course, the Greeks already had procedures and algorithms. For instance, the division algorithm and the algorithm to find the greatest common denominator. You talk about that. So actually the concept or the attitude is much older. Could you comment on that? Yes. So um, to elaborate a little bit about um, the transformations of the word algorithm, just as you say, um, it is from the great Persian mathematician and polymath, um, Al-Khwarizmi, um, who was a towering figure in the history of mathematics. This was not his only accomplishment. And when um, his work became partly translated into Latin, um, it became to refer to the manipulation of a certain kind of numeral, that is not just numbers, but numerals, how they were written. And those have, we now call them Hindu Arabic numbers. So this was um, not just about um, the four fundamental operations of arithmetic, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, but also a certain kind of um, coding of those numbers and operations, which um, the Latin, countries um, over, took over from um, the Islamic world, where um, at the time, um, mathematics and um, especially the exact sciences were, were flourishing. So um, it, it was um, always considered to be a very specific kind of manipulation of, of, of numbers. Um, in you know, the course of centuries, the empire of algorithms um, has expanded a great deal, but you're right to say that there are, at least with 2020 hindsight, um, forms of mathematical reasoning that we would now identify as um, algorithms. And one of them, as you mentioned, um, is in Euclid, it's a method for finding um, prime factorization. Um, I think what's very interesting is the way in which we look at the Greek tradition of mathematics in contrast to other mathematical traditions in the world um, because of the enormous influence of Euclid and also Archimedes, um, whom no one would dispute are titanic figures in the history of mathematics. There has been an emphasis on something, an aspect of Greek mathematics, which is probably, if you think of just um, a quantitative survey, not very representative, which is demonstrations. Whereas, 
probably the vast majority of ancient Greek mathematics, like ancient um, Sanskrit mathematics, ancient Sumerian mathematics, um, ancient um, Arabic mathematics, is about problem solving, mm -hmm. um, and therefore about algorithms. So um, we, we think about Euclid when we think about this, because Euclid stands allegorically for all of ancient Greek mathematics. But in fact, he's simply the, type, the tip of an iceberg of a, you know, a huge buried continent of algorithmic reasoning. Yes. So, you know, for us, for us in math education, we always have the question, how much proving is good for school students? You know, there's always a discussion. And in Germany, Christina Reis is one of the exponents of, you know, thinking that proofs are good and demonstrations are good, while <laughs> at least school students would much prefer to just learn procedures. Don't tell me what it means. Just tell me what I have to do. Like, for instance, to find uh, a prime factorization, to make division, you know. And when we want to convince them that understanding stuff, just, you know, think of the rule of divisibility by three. A student asked, when is a number divisible by three? If he has some memory, he will say, when the sum of the digits add up to something divisible by three. Ask him whether he can prove it. Most of the time, he will say or she will say no. Some people think that if they had learned the proof, which is easy, it's, you know, the distributive law and, you know, the decimal number system and so on, uh, they would know it better. What is your opinion on procedural learning or declarative <laughs> learning? Uh, I, I think they have very different functions, frankly. Um, so the procedural learning, which is the way in which most um, arithmetic was has been taught for much of the world's history and most of the world's cultures is extremely efficient. Um, if you had to sit down and prove um, the um, rule you just described about divisible by three, every time you used it, it would take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. um, so, and because many of the people, not all, but many of the people who bothered to learn this form of mathematics were using it for practical purposes. The Rechenmeister, for example, mm -hmm. of um, medieval and, um, and Renaissance Europe, um, uh, that would have been um, an extravagance with regard to what they mm -hmm. needed it for. On the other hand, you're, I, I speak now only for myself, um, I, until we got to the point where we had demonstrations in school, I rather loathed the math classes. Mm -hmm. The moment we got to geometry, I was enchanted, absolutely enchanted. Mm -hmm. And I spent most of, I must say, ninth grade trying to trisect an angle with ruler and compass, <laughs> convinced that it somehow could be done. <laughs> um, but you know. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. I, 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 I learned only much later that it was proved to be impossible. Mm -hmm. um, but but, um, but I, so I think that they, these, these two versions of mathematics serve very different purposes. It's a bit analogous to the relationship between um, speaking your, your native tongue, in which you very seldom think about um, the rules of grammar, for example, um, uh, versus um, speaking a language you've acquired later, a second or third or fourth language, in which always in the back of your mind, um, there is um, a, 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 a small voice whispering, does it take the accusative, the genitive, the dative, is it dandy das, et cetera, um, et cetera. Um, and I, I think that that more or less corresponds in some ways to the difference. So the, the, the fluidity of um, speaking your native language corresponds to the extreme efficiency of memorizing all those procedural rules mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. understanding, really understanding a language and understanding the grammar of a language, which many people do only after they've learned a second language. Mm -hmm. um, that I think um, both of those are extremely, in my mind, valuable mm -hmm. learning experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one other point in your book and also in the Vimeo, you know, that I mentioned is that, of course, if everything becomes algorithmic and if rules somehow are identified with reason or what 
rationality, you know, all that discussion is very deep and very difficult. But th there seems to be in your attitude uh, the belief that if we identify reasoning with the procedural conduction, you know, con conduction of algorithms and rules, etc., we are reducing reason. There is a loss. And you, in your in the Vimeo that I saw again this morning, you cite Kant and the critique of Newton, etc. Is there a loss if we reduce as even, you know, one thinks even Simon is a reductionist in this sense, when he thinks that the procedures are the essence of rationality, there is a reduction. Are you, what is your opinion on this problem of reduction to algorithm? I think both both reason and rationality, and if we understand rationality as it's increasingly been understood in the 20th century um, and the 21st century as um, a reduction to um, definite procedures. And so not only mathematical procedures, but also, for example, think of assembling your um, IKEA bookshelves. Um, the idea is to have a set of procedures which are as unambiguous as possible um, and which have a definite outcome and a definite um, input at, at the beginning. There's, there are certainly enormous gains um, from that kind of rationality. And at the outset of the interview, um, I explained that my original interest had been in a situation, the situation of the Cold War nuclear detente in exactly such a situation. The problem is that the algorithms cannot tell you when, which algorithm to apply when. So there are two problems here. First, you're confronted with a situation, um, at least in the old days before um, we had computers to do this for us or calculators. Um, um, if you had to integrate uh, an equation, um, you had to sort of figure out which way you should integrate it. Um, mm -hmm. So you had to decide which algorithm, there were algorithms for integration, but which algorithm was going to work for this function, for example. Um, so first you have to figure out, and this is the case with all rules, not just with algorithms, um, is this the right domain for the application of this algorithm? And then an even greater problem is, what happens if the situation is not exactly the prototypical situation for which the algorithm was designed. So let me dramatize this because it was dramatized um, in many movies and novels during the Cold War. What happens if the nuclear attack launched was not launched on purpose, but by accident? Um, the algorithm is designed um, to retaliate against an intentional attack, but what about an accidental attack? Um, so at both of those points where algorithms fear to tread, judgment, which is, as Kant said, the faculty by which we know how to apply universals to particulars, um, must intrude. Mm -hmm. And also, for instance, what, I don't know what your opinion is on this, when Hilbert and Bernays rewrote geometry completely based on, say, the algorithm of proof, starting with the axioms, the, the mathematical community thought, ah, look at this, you can do the whole of geometry just by very technical. But the answer was, and even Benford Russell said, okay, but who chooses the interesting things? You see, Euclid is a collection of very interesting and very useful results, like you know, uh, Pythagoras theorem and the sum of the angles of a triangle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is some choice of the topics treated in that fantastic collection of books. And who does that? Who chooses the interesting questions? So far, artificial intelligence, I think, and I want your opinion, is not that far to choose to start a new yeah. topic mm -hmm. and develop the interesting things. Yeah, that's a very interesting observation. And one should think, you know, what what lay behind the Bernays Hilbert project to axiomatize, re-axiomatize geometry. And it was a whole 19th century history of coming to distrust mathematicians' intuitions. Mm 
So exactly those intuitions which are of such inestimable heuristic value for, as you say, knowing what's interesting, what to collect, um, what to push further, where there are rich results still waiting to be discovered, um, that became ever more suspect, first in the context of the foundations of the calculus, but then um, in the further pursuit of rigor, in looking at the at Luke Euclid himself. So um, to give one obvious example, um, the proofs for congruence of triangles depend on an idea of movement implicitly, in which you're supposed to imagine one triangle superimposed upon another. And that was also the case in the original formulations of the calculus, especially in Newton's formulation, which it depends completely on thinking about moving points and moving planes and the like, because it was, um, in Newton's mind, um, um, braided together with rational mechanics, um, mm -hmm. not so much in Leibniz's mind, but in, in, in Newton's mind. So um, the idea of the purity of mathematics, which would divorce it from any reference, however implicit, to the physical world was behind um, this complete rethinking of Euclid in formal logical terms to purge it of intuition. What that meant was that what had formerly been the guarantee of the rigor of mathematics, the certainty of mathematics, but for Descartes, for example, how do we know um, that something is reliably true when it has the self-evidence of Euclidean geometry, that that exactly that intuition, which had been the basis of rigor for 2000 years, um, was undermined. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the Bernays-Hilbert project is a, an attempt to patch up what was seen to be a leaky ship. It's not an attempt to build the ship from scratch, it's not an attempt to sail the ship someplace else. It's a damage control operation. Um, and the same can be said for a lot of efforts at axiomatization in the 20th century. For example, the Kolmogorov axioms for probability theory. Mm -hmm. Yes. But yet axiomatization is very useful and we are grateful, even if we are aware that, for instance, the Kolmogorov axiomatization it makes things so abstract that the distance to intuition, as we know, you know, in all the results about humans, humans' difficulties trying to do Bayes' theorem, because P of A given B is such an abstract, not only notation, but concept, that regaining intuition is something that the cognitive psychologists, and we can name many that we know very well, have worked on to try to go back to the intuition. So axiomatization is fantastic and shows that it is possible, of course, to, to embed probability theory into the edifice of set theory, but then we lose intuitions. Yes, so. I, I, I think that this, is, this just shows how important mathematical pedagogy is. Um, I recently read the memoir of a, an economist who had started out as a mathematician. And he says he became an economist when he was in graduate school in mathematics because he, he couldn't find the intuitions. He was um, attending graduate school at the zenith of the reputation of the Bourbaki. This was the collective of French mathematicians who rather whimsically chose the name of a French general named Nicolas Bourbaki mm -hmm. as um, their nom de plume when they published. And their goal was a kind of um, pure axiomatization in terms of set theory um, of all of mathematics. And it was an, certainly an admirable, very elegant achievement. But when you read the Bourbaki fascicules, they themselves say, nobody is going to be able to get through this. So they were, we're going to, even though we don't think they're strictly relevant, we're going to have to give you examples. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that anecdote of the, the mathematician turned economist tells us something very deep about a split these days between the way in which mathematics is taught and the way in which um, mathematics is, is published. Um, and there, there's a very 
interesting book that's forthcoming by a historian of mathematics named Alma Steingart about the rise of abstraction um, in the 20th century. And um, I've heard, I've read a few of her articles so far, and I, um, it's an extremely interesting book because she shows that um, with each new wave of abstraction, the textbook writers protested and said, we have got to teach this stuff. Um, and moreover, we we want the mathematicians of the future to be creative mathematicians, not just rigorous mathematicians, but creative mathematicians. And so there was a turn to, for example, Polya's How to Prove It mm-hmm. and other writings about intuitions and heuristics in mathematics. So what is her name? I look it up. Of um, Steingart, um, S-T-E-I-N-G-A-R-T. Her first name is Alma. Alma. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's a, what, do you know the title also? No. I think, I think abstraction History. is the first word. Abstraction. <laughs> Thank you. I look it up and perhaps order it. Mm-hmm. So this is very, very interesting because, of course, as you say, the one <laughs> axiomatization is the enemy of intuition. And yes, we have this problem all the time. When I came to Germany, I was coming from Colombia. And in Colombia, we use the American books. And the American books back in the 60s were still very much oriented towards examples. So they started, suppose you want to go from this point to this other. And they draw many drawings. And when I came to Germany, uh, it was the opposite. You see, the professors were all Bourbakists. It was 72 in Tübingen. They were, you know, using almost the Bourbaki uh, notation and all these symbols and all this uh, very strong formalization and I it was at the mo- at the beginning a very difficult period of adoption for me and then I remember their teaching filling those blackboards with all those symbols and then some examples, and then the exercises. So our our task was to do exercises, and some of them consisted of proving stuff using all that axiomatization and formalization. So they were very difficult. The first years for me were very difficult until I somehow got used to that. I must say that the American books have defended the attitude of starting with examples through the decades, which is fantastic. While in Europe, there has been, you know, this ten- the very Bourbakis tendency. And then lately, some books like the one I'm using now for algebra is called Erlebnis Algebra. And it does make the effort of going through Erkundung, you know, experience, and then instruction or discussion. What is your your opinion on this effort of starting with Erkundung or investigation? So it returns us to um, an earlier point in our conversation, which is about that third strand of the three original meanings of rules, namely the model. And that's what the examples are. Um, For those of us who, like you, learn from American textbooks with examples, uh, when I and solving uh, an equation, two simultaneous equations and two unknowns, I am thinking in the back of my mind, this is a bathtub problem because, or it's a train problem because the prototypical examples for solving this kind of um, problem in my textbook um, were, imagine there are two trains, they are going (laughs) at different velocities. (laughs) Um, And what, what one learns from the history of mathematics, and not just the history of mathematics of the Western tradition, but in every tradition for which we have records, is that this is always the way in which mathematics has been taught. And that the importance of the model is not just that it's concrete versus abstract, but that in a mysterious way that I think psychologists still don't understand, we think analogically and we recognize when we're confronted with a completely different problem with completely different particulars, that it has the same structure as the um, simultaneous equations of the bathtub problem or the, or the, the train problem. And the only way um, that I can make sense of this, although it doesn't explain it, it's merely yet another comparison, is the way in which um, naturalists um, who classify plants and classify birds and animals 
learn at a glance to recognize that, ah, it's a member of the magpie species or a member of the wormwood species amongst um, plants, which is a kind of um, generic imagination which allows you to generalize even though um, the particulars of this exemplar may differ from those you have encountered in the past. So that, I think, is the Erkundungs part of this. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it says something quite deep about the way in which we we actually in practice generalize by analogy mm-hmm. all the time, including in mathematics. This is not in any way to um, undervalue the enormous um, achievement of stepping back and formalizing the implicit rules. It's just mm-hmm. to say that the two of one of them Um, cannot exist without the other. Mm -hmm. Um, It is, I think, an illusion to think either that mathematics can progress without that um, formalization, but also an illusion to think that it can progress with only that formalization. Yes. So we use the example when we teach, you know, mathematics, we say, okay, you can describe the natural numbers by having certain properties. You can describe the even numbers as natural numbers with a certain property, but you could also just list them or at least some of them and then stop and dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. And these are two very different attitudes. So you can have the experience, you know, of even numbers, two, four, six, eight, dot, dot, dot. Or I can tell you a property that defines the set of, of even numbers. So, the description or the property or the intention with an S, as the logique of Port-Royal called this, is very different from the extension, which corresponds to the experience. And, you know, if we talk, teach mathematics only algorithmically or as sets of rules, we tend to eliminate that experience, you know, the listing of things and presenting of things. Look at all the possible triangles. Just sit down, take some scissors and cut off some triangles and see what happens and measure the angles with a protractor, which is an instrument, of course, not allowed in the Indian geometry. Right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the school students love the protractor and measure up the angles and see that there are some similarities in the sum of those angles. And do you approve that we, you know, lose, spend time cutting triangles and adding up the sum, you know, of angles and one good day learning about a theorem, etc.? I, 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 I certainly um, think it's time well spent. I'd only say that um, it would be a pity if one neglected entirely the more formal demonstrative side of mathematics, because it's highly variable. I mean, all of us who teach know how variable our students are. That is, mm-hmm. I'm not speaking about their levels of achievement or engagement. I'm thinking about the way in which they think, that it's really interesting to see how very differently, um, just in a small classroom, um, when students think. Some um, Im- immediately um, both understand and delight in the more formal aspects. Others are very quick to respond to the exercise, for example, the physical exercise of really getting to know triangles with your eye and your hands. And what one wants is, at least, you know, I imagine, um, a kind of supple pedagogy, which offers both approaches, mm-hmm. or more than two approaches, mm-hmm. so that each student can find um his or her foothold in the material and then go on to master the other approaches. Yeah, this is fascinating. This is fascinating. We, of course, know about the variance in students in classes. And it is a remarkable result in many, many studies that those considered the best pupils combine both. So if you look, there are those who like the procedural and are very good at it. There are those who are intuitive and have ideas. But indeed, the best ones are those who manage to combine these two, and those get the high grades. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have the lazy ones. Don't forget, 
<laughs> yes, well, every teacher knows, yes. <laughs> every teacher knows. And yeah. they, those lazy ones, almost, as I told you before, prefer to quickly learn some rule. Just tell me what I have to do and, you know, try to learn it as a recipe. And sometimes they forget it and get bad grades. And, you know, so this is our feeling, you know, in, in math education, we transmit this idea that classes have these two extremes. And then in the middle, there is, you know, some, both, both uh, tendencies are represented, but at the extremes, we see those two. The lazy ones who would rather have some procedure that they try to learn by heart. And you talk a lot about learning by heart, par coeur, uh, in the book. And those who combine this intuitive creativity, a word which is very difficult, you know, they are creative, and they also learn the procedures, but understand them. They could tell you at any moment why a number is divisible by three when this and that, because they have understood it. And apparently, they don't forget it. Longitudinal studies show that they don't forget it. They don't forget those rules. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I hadn't known about those longitudinal studies, but it makes excellent sense. Um, I would only say that um, you know you know this far better than I from your experience in mathematics education. But mathematics has a very peculiar status in the curriculum, and it is often hedged about for many students with fear, um, and. I sometimes wonder whether the students who are described as lazy are the ones who have given up and who want, as you say, to do the bare minimum they can to get through and then hope they'll never have to encounter um, any mathematics again in their lives, aside from balancing their checkbook. Um, and I, I think that one of the aims of the wonderful exercise you described about cutting up the triangles and measuring the angles, et cetera, is that it gives even those students who feel that their experience to date of mathematics has been failure, a chance to say, this I understand. You know, th at least this part I understand, which can be, not always of course, but can be um, the, the first foothold in what they've, in the ascent of what they've previously seen as a kind of glass mountain, so slippery that they could never um, get to the top. And um, mm -hmm. so I think I, I simply um, applaud that exercise. I think it, it, it means that everybody, everybody can relate to that level, even if not everyone will then go on um, to try to understand the principles that make for, you know, side angle, side congruency um, in, in triangles. Some of them ask, let's call them the lazy ones, which is perhaps not the right word, but some of them ask, why should I learn all this stuff and understand all this stuff when my calculator, you see, I have this Texas instrument yes, thing, <laughs> you know, can compute the solution of quadratic, quadratic equations. Like, so they wonder, and sometimes artificial intelligence and informatics and so on uh, become an obstacle to teaching the old math based on improves and creativity, etc., because it competes saying, listen, you can do all this on a calculator. Why would you understand all this stuff? Why would you waste your time? And then they say, and why do we have four hours of math? And I, you know, we say, well, it was the French. <laughs> it was the French. <laughs> so it was Laplace. It was those guys who somehow identified in some sense reason with proving and logic and those regula, regulae, and somehow they impose because the French curriculum is the first that adopts for as many hours of math as of language. What do you think of that? Yeah, no, it's extremely interesting. And it's a French revolutionary development. It's, you know, with the foundation in the 1795 of the, the first of the grands écoles, um, the École Polytechnique and the École Normale. Um, and it's in part an accident in that Napoleon 
um, had gone to the Ecole Militaire, where he, I think he'd been taught by Laplace. Um, 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 I'm not entirely either Laplace or Lagrange, but in any case, he, as a trained engineer, very much valued mathematical instruction. But mathematics has been used in a very interesting way in the French educational system and those that derive from it, which is, as you say, Laplace equated it with reason to go, but also, um, as you were mentioning earlier, it is a way of stratifying students. So it's not the only way of stratifying students, but it's one way of stratifying students, of getting a very clear hierarchy um, of, of grades. And um, it has performed the function, in a sense, of a general intelligence test in the French curriculum in the way that Greek and Latin did for much of the 19th and early 20th centuries in the British system. So a completely different accomplishment, but also one um, which has a very highly technical side, in this case, um, you know, mastering the 642 parts of every ancient Greek verb, um, but um, allows for a stratification of ability. And what's very interesting, I have to say about this is that I would certainly not say it's an infallible guide to general ability, um, but it, you know, when it has produced um, leaders um, in fields as diverse as politics, business, um, even bishops um, uh, who do well on these kinds of exercises. So it's not an entirely fanciful um, index of general ability, albeit a very, very crude one. But I want to say something about memorization. Um, since the 18th century, really since the spread of books and literacy, there has been um, a certain scorn, especially in pedagogical circles, for what is called in English brute memorization, which tells you everything about it. Um, I think it's extremely valuable to have learned the multiplication tables by heart mm -hmm. and also to learn um, even memorization of verse by heart. Um, there is wonderful work done by musicologists on how the choristers of Notre Dame in medieval France were able to master um, in very short order, extremely complicated um, musical scores, often without any kind of score in front of them, any kind of notation, because they had memorized modules, um, musical modules that could like Lego blocks be put together again, which is a way of thinking also about what we memorize in mathematics. If you, um, if you know the basic proofs about um, proving triangles congruent, you can do a lot of other things um, in, with parallelograms and other, and other figures. Um, so I, I do not share um, the scorn of memorization. Mm -hmm. And for those who think their calculator can do it, I would remind them that the calculator, first of all, is only as smart as the person who is punching in the figures. If you punch in the wrong figures and don't realize this and have no idea what the order of magnitude of your answer will be, mm -hmm. you can get yourself into big trouble. Um, mm -hmm. uh, witness, for example, um, the poor engineers at NASA who confused imperial with metric weight, metric measures, mm -hmm. and thereby crashed a $125 million um, Mars lander <laughs> um, as, as a result, simply because you have to pay attention to what you are punching into the calculator or the computer yeah. um, in order to realize um, whether or not the answer makes sense or not. Um, yes. You even say at some moment in the book, that going orchestrating calculations using a machine could mean rethinking the algorithms of arithmetic. So when you are good at orchestrating in your little calculator some problem and transforming it into solving of a quadratic equation, this orchestrating needs, of course, a lot of understanding, rethink, you know. It. Yes, yes. I think that that's often um, made invisible. Um, so that we imagine two levels when there are really three. So at the very top level, there are the mathematicians who are thinking up the formulae that 
um, guide all the calculations. And then at the bottom level, we see those rows and rows in the 20th century, almost all of women who are punching in numbers in their into their calculating machines or now into their um, computers. In the middle, there are the people who have to translate um, the general equations into um, a workflow, an orchestration mm-hmm. of the calculations, which can then be realized by the people at their calculating um, mm-hmm. machines. And that that middle level sort of disappears um, in our imaginations of what is going on, but it's extremely important. And some people, in, for instance, at my institution, uh, there is a guy called Lothe, he's now emeritus, and he devised ways of teaching students something called Scheme, a simple program. And by programming mathematical or, you know, mathematical problems into Scheme, he said, and he could prove somehow empirically, that students understood even better what was going on mathematically by programming I, I, with Scheme. I find that extremely plausible. And when you think about what programming is, it is this four orchestration. You are dividing up a very complicated problem into steps, one by one by one. Um, and the steps have to be unambiguous so that a machine could execute them. Um, and they have to be absolutely transparent. There can't be um, any kind of equivocation. And they have to be complete. They have to you know, get you to the destination, the wanted destination. Um, and I think that that's That's an exercise which is not only um, helpful for reinforcing mathematical understanding, but the understanding of any task. So the cookbook, for example, what is a cookbook? But exactly, so if I am told, could you please produce a Sache Torte? I have absolutely no idea where even to begin. Um, What the cookbook does is to in a sense, create a program which divides it up into a um, step-by-step schema, it, starting with a list of the ingredients that I am going to need. Mm-hmm. And the sequential ordering is so useful. So we are so... Absolutely, yes, yes. Yes, that's very important that you mention that. It's not, you can't just um, jumble together these steps in any order. The order is very important. Yes, and the Italians have discussed for centuries whether you put first the garlic or the parsley. <laughs> And they claim that it makes a huge difference. So and what they is the, what, and, and um, this is this is like the British discussion of whether or not first you put the milk in yeah. the tea or the tea or yeah. then the milk, yeah. and they claim they can tell. Yeah, the, the lady. Yes, the lady. Yes, yes, this exactly. Is very interesting. Ronald Fisher. Yes. <laughs> so now, as a last question, you see there is a struggle in math education or in informatics education to somehow have less math hours and put more informatics hours in the school curriculum. I wanted to know your opinion because there are no other subjects that can, you can steal from. So there has been from history, they've stolen to do something with economics, etc. So there has been a lot of stealing already. The question is, would you recommend stealing from the four hours (laughs) (laughs) for informatics? To have a little bit more informatics. First of all, I'm so glad it's not my decision to take the responsibility for what a difficult decision. Um, You know, thinking about your colleague and his scheme, um, if that's the way informatics is taught, then I think it would be a good idea. I think what worries me about um, the what what worries me is the black box character of the word informatics, which I, I do not know really what that means in terms of teaching. Um, And uh, when I hear, you know, um, words like um, that students should be taught to go digital, does this mean just that they know how to um, navigate the internet? Does it mean that they know how to fact check a website? Does it mean that they know how to program? So Mm -hmm. um, one would really want to look at the insides, the contents of that black box word informatics Mm -hmm. and find Mm -hmm. out before making such a decision. Yes. So the people at my, there is a professor for informatics education, and he has started a project 
where you teach in kindergarten how to pack your back pad or uh, how to pack your rucksack. Mm -hmm. So what do you put first? And doing that in a sequential program is already the beginning of programming. So you can start very early with young children something that will be in the end programming. How do you, as you say, re recipes, what do you put first, the books or the colors yeah. and so on? It also, is, it also is an excellent exercise in developing the spatial imagination, three-dimensional spatial imagination yes. of how to, you know, this little corner, that will fit. Um, it's always very interesting to me that um, there were certain tasks which were considered quintessentially feminine tasks, um, which are, for example, you have a piece of fabric and you must cut out a pattern on it. And the fabric is expensive. You cannot waste a, a single scrap of it. The pattern must fit exactly. This is a real exercise in two-dimensional spatial reasoning. Um, the idea that somehow women are, in are bad at spatial reasoning um, flies in the teeth of this practical evidence. So mm -hmm. developing such skills at an early age um, strikes me is in every way to um, be encouraged. Okay. The very last question now, which I had written here as my last question, is that you inform us on the beginnings of artificial intelligence and how, in 1956, Newell and Simon developed a computer model to prove theorems that relied heavily on heuristic methods in contrast with, I cite you, systematic, I cite you citing them, systematic computational methods. What has happened then, in your opinion, in this area we call artificial intelligence? Where have all the heuristics have gone? I think the, the short answer to that is the enormous increase and in speed of calculation. Um, so that um, the in initial AI programs um, like Newell and Simons, but also Wang's, although it was rather different, um, had to economize because um, the early computers had both limited memory and limited processing power. Um, the uh, exponential increase since the 1990s of speed of calculation and calculating power um, has meant that these rather elegant programs, which are programs which have to think economically about how you can get um, the most from the most parsimonious um, assumptions, a very mathematical thought, you know, how you can get the most theorems from the fewest axioms, that's just been thrown overboard because it's now cheap to have brute force calculation um, and one of the more spectacular successes has been programs like Deep Blue that um, are so powerful that they can win by sheer combinatorial force against chess grandmasters. But I think there's a caveat to this, um, which is that we know how expensive in terms of energy use such brute force calculation is. For the moment, the spotlight is resting on um, Bitcoin and other such currencies and the enormous electricity costs of calculation, but the same could be said for all of those servers operating all over the world. And perhaps, perhaps as a result of our attempts to be um, more frugal in our use of energy for the sake of the planet, um, we will go back to some of those original AI methods.